So it's going to be a very interactive um, section today. Um, I, I believe that I am in conversation with um, very great minds um, who are looking to address the challenge with reproductive health here in, I would say in Nigeria and then in Africa as well. Um, and as such, I see everyone on this call as a winner or as winners um, who are actually co, um, should I say co-designers looking to design strategies and solutions that can address more of the pressing issues on our continent. Today I'll be talking about human-centered design and HCD is something um, that, you know, could take, you know, even workshops of up to three or four days to cover. Um, however, I'll try to um, compress the information about HCD into a one-hour conversation today. Um, and you all will be part of that conversation. I call it a conversation because I believe that we're going back and forth with ideas um, as time will permit us. However, if we do not have sufficient time, um, we're going to provide you with some links to relevant documents and reference documents that you can use to strengthen your knowledge and your skill in the use of um, HCD. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen now. Uh, just let me know once you are able to see my screen. <clears throat> All right. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Beautiful. Okay. So first of all, my screen is com screen is coming up. Can anybody tell me what they know or understand by human centered design? Have you heard about it before? Is it something you know about? Um, do you have in depth knowledge about it? Do you not? I'd like to know. Um, what you know about HCD. So please use the chat box and just let me know. Have you had any experience using HCD? Do you know anything about HCD? Are you an expert? Can we use the chat box, please? <clears throat> or the group chats. Good. Yeah, someone says, Valerie says, I know about HCD, fantastic. Any other response? So like I said, it's going to be an interactive um, session today. Um, so if you do not respond, it means that we can't really move forward or move, move as fast as we need to. All right, so what is HCD? Um, it's really a problem solving approach that puts the user at the center of the solution. Fantastic, Israel says, I have used HCD approach. Uh, Right, so it's a creative approach for problem solving. Uh, it's a collection of mindsets um, that helps in designing solution that puts the user at the center of it. Um, it involves um, various expertise and a lot of time it involves collaboration with various experts. Um, it also involves the use of a set of skills, right? To think and then to create solutions. 
why is HCD approach important, especially um, in reproductive health? Why is this something of importance? Um, whenever you're thinking of achieving better outcome, improving processes, expanding capabilities, increasing sustainability and equity, human-centered design approach is one of the approaches that you can essentially consider. And I, I like to say that one of, one of the ways to determine if human-centered approach is the approach of choice to utilize, considering that there are various approaches that you can use towards um, designing solutions, is really to think about the complexity of the solution, of the problem. When a challenge is really complex, when it involves various stakeholders, when it's likely going to impact various um, stakeholders, or like people like to say, when you think that that problem is a wicked problem, one of the methods to consider in getting a solution is using the HCD approach. Um, I would move further. I, I won't want to spend time on the different types of design thinking. I'll make the slides available. Um, like I've mentioned, um, the challenges you have with most of the other types of, um, of um, design thinking or approaches is that a lot of the time it is siloed. It's really focused on one thing, either finance, so you could have um, a finance-driven solution, right? Um, it's usually siloed. There's a lack of empathy or consideration for the beneficiaries of the solution. Sometimes it can be impractical, inefficient, right? Um, other times it may not sufficiently utilize relevant research or data, limited stakeholder engagement, and sometimes it could even lead to resistance in the use of technology at the end of the day, because it's not essentially meeting the needs. Another important thing to take note of is the fact that, you know, issues such as sustainability could become a concern, especially when people don't feel carried along in solving the problem. As it relates to reproductive health, there are various factors that can impact, you know, um, the reproductive health of a person. And from nutrition to infectious diseases to education and awareness, right, to... Uh, knowledge about their maternal and child health issues. There are various other factors, um, socioeconomic issues. As such, when you think about uh, reproductive health concerns, it's really important that you start to look at the problem, um, the method of solving the problem, of how you can, it's best you start to think about how you can utilize HCD to solve um, such problems. So I will continue with a question. And this is a question for everyone on the call. Um, what type of innovator are you? When you start working on a new idea, what's the first thing that you do? Do you dive into the solution? Do you create time to spend, do you spend time with some users? Do you start writing the ideas down and then start to act on it afterwards? Or what other ways do you really um, think through your challenges and then come up with innovations? Please use the chat box or use the chat. I'd like to see. Yeah, Victoria said, see, she starts to write her idea. Very typical, most of us do that. Uh, anyone who really just says, you know what, I have a solution in mind and I think I'm gonna create something. Or is there anyone that says, you know what, I need to know who the users are gonna be and I need to interact with them. Israel said, see, fantastic. Um, Victoria and Israel really engage in the comments section. Fantastic. Any other person? At times I do A, to be honest. Thank you, Olua, to me for being very honest. And Bukola says C, fantastic. Are there other ways, apart from A, B, C, are there other ways? Write the ideas down, figure out related existing solution. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, so I have a quick question also for everyone. Um, Quick question for everyone. What kind of city room do you think that I would like? So I have a problem. I really want to furnish my city room today. I mean, okay, within this month. Can anyone tell me what kind of city room they think I like? I'm a female, um, I'm tall, I'm fairly light skinned, I'm not, but anyway, <laughs> right. What kind of city room do you think I'd like? Anyone? 
or you can go into talking about what should be in the city room that I would like. Anyone? Okay, so while we're waiting for um, responses on that, cozy chair with good lightning. Mm, Bukola, very good. You must be in my mind right now. I must be thinking what I'm thinking. Cozy chair, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bukola. Any other? Any other person? Okay, so I'll go ahead because of time. A cozy room with sittings that will allow you to study, a warm, spacious, and well furnished sitting room with good lighting. Fantastic. These are great ideas. Great ideas. Great ideas. However, I, I agree with you all that I would need cozy sitting, cozy chairs, cozy couches in my sitting room, but I actually need chairs that are really long that I can rest on you know, and spread my very long legs on. I'm really not crazy about TVs. Oh, soft music on the ground. Who is this person? <laughs> Fantastic. Now, while there are generic things that I might like or want in my city room, it's also very possible that as much as you go on guessing and guessing, you may actually miss out the critical things that I need in my city room, right? And even if you know me to an extent, without necessarily coming to me to ask me the questions, you may really be guessing and you may be actually jumping over the actual issues that I have. Because currently, if I need new furniture in my sitting room, the major furniture I actually need is really a very big couch that allows me to spread my legs and is really comfortable. And so you can provide me with good lighting, furnish my sitting room, soft music in the background, but still you may not have met my need. And that's what HCD tries to help us do, um, to help us not necessarily dive into solutions, but really spend time with our users and really get to understand them. And I'm hoping that we'll get to understand the techniques and the tools for doing so by the end of today. Okay, let's move forward. So design thinking starts with the people, starts with the people, starts with the people. So we're thinking, who are the people? Everybody, the people, everyone involved, every stakeholder, the people. We're thinking from the people's perspective. All right, there are sets of mindsets that you get, you, you, um, you need to wear or have to be able to um, use the human-centered design approach. And one of the key uh, mindsets is empathy. Empathy really involves you wearing the shoes of your actual users. Um, you're not just um, thinking from your comfort zone, but you're saying, hmm, you know, what's really trying to understand the context that they are in, right? Who are they? What do they do? How, how do they live their lives? It really goes beyond understanding that context to also empathizing with them, which means you're asking questions like, what do you see? How do you feel? How do you act? What do you say, right? So it's beyond just seeing the context around them, but really coming to empathize with them and understand their feelings, their emotions, their actions, um, and how they compensate for the absence of the solutions that they want. And then there's optimism. You have to be able to think that you're gonna come out with a good solution at the end of the day. The opposite of that is pessimism, right? Which is seeing the cup um, half empty. You're constantly thinking, oh, there's a problem. Something is wrong. But with optimism, you're constantly thinking, I'm going to come out with a solution, right? Creative confidence, quite similar. You believe that you're going to create something that's really going to work. And it's important that you walk in with such mindsets. Learning from failure. Understand that sometimes things may fail, right? And that's why the idea of iterate, iterate, iterate matters. It means that you can come up with an idea or a solution but from your understanding of what the problem is. And then you can go back to the end user to say, hey, here's what we've done. Is this really what you were asking for? And the person says, hell no, 
this is what I meant and not this. And then you iterate. So you see failure as an opportunity to learn and improve and iterate rather than just being failure itself. Embrace ambiguity. At the start of every project, you really don't know where you're heading to and you really need to embrace that. Sometimes people think, oh, um, there are a lot of young girls in, in Northern Nigeria who really are not aware about um, reproductive health issues or how to use contraceptives. And we just have to think solution. Take a moment to chill and say, hey, I don't really know what's going to work for Northern girls in Nigeria, but I'm eager to find the solution, right? So be rest assured that at the end of this process, I will know what really works, but it's okay for me not to really know what will work at the very beginning. Make it mindset. It's still similar to optimism. You believe that you're going to come out with a fantastic solution. So I like this quote by Krista, which says, in the end, it doesn't matter what you see or how beautiful the result is. The goal is always to convey an idea, share it, learn how to make it better. So I think this might work. You share it with the stakeholders and then you learn from them how to continuously make it better. It doesn't have to be fantastic at the beginning but share it, learn, and make it better. Um, next slide. So let's talk about the human-centered design framework. We're going to be discussing some of the, you know, the thinking and the tools, the techniques and the tools um, that you can utilize. There are four key phases within the HCD framework, which is the discover, the understand, the create, and implement. You would see some dotted lines inside, uh, you know, this structure that almost look like a circle. Um, and you see them going, you know, diverging and converging and diverging and converging. It's really just showing you um, the flow of information and ideas. At the discover phase, you may not have a lot of information, but as much you, you do a lot of research and you start to pull together the knowledge that you have, and then you bring that information together and you start to see um, insights. You're able to draw insights from different research that you've conducted and that flow continues in that way, expanding, you know, ex um, converging and expanding throughout the entire process. Um, I'd like to just go straight into each of these phases and then let's start to talk about what it really involves. Now, the discover phase. It's important for me to mention that um, while design thinking and human-centered design is really, it really involves research, it also does not throw away existing research or existing forms of research that you're, you're quite familiar with, right? Your quantitative research and all sorts of research. It takes into consideration existing researches, right? Publications, ETC, they are very important. But beyond those research, right? It also sort of takes a personal perspective into interacting with users to really understand what they want. You can think of, uh, for people who've done psychology, and behavioral studies, they may have experienced those sort of research that involves you immersing yourself um, within the context, community, the people who are actually going to be end users. And, and that's what really you'll be doing at the discover phase. At discover phase, you will be acknowledging what you already know, right? And collecting your thoughts together about the challenge. I know Northern Nigeria, for example, there are yeah, young girls there because of the religious, uh, you know, the religious um, affiliations, there are certain things they are unable to see, do, or interact with. As thought, there may be limited knowledge or limited information. And then you take that information and you start to say, okay, where can I find relevant information to support or to give me more clarity around what I already know? And so it's important for you to check through studies, research, ETC. But what is most important is that you learn from the people and that you learn from the experts. And so whatever immersive approach allows you to be able to understand emotions, behaviors, and then take that into your research is very important, right? If you need to do walkthroughs into communities to really see how people behave, have interviews, have focus group discussions, right? Um, those are really important. And so in this stage, you're basically identifying the challenge, identifying the research participants, who will I need to interact with, who are the experts, who are the beneficiaries, who do I really need to talk to? And then you need to decide for each of these people, what sort of research do I want to conduct, right? 
um, what sort of research, what methods do I want to play in, put in place? What sort of techniques do I want to use in drawing that information? And basically, how do I develop the information that I get? And how am I going to interpret it? And we'll look at some of the ways that you can do that. <clears throat> so basically, design phase, um, you understand what the challenge is. You frame it, you recruit, you plan. Usually during this phase, participants have diverging views. And so at the end of the phase, it's expected that you synthesize those views and information and insights and identify what the opportunities might be and also present them back to stakeholders for validation. I'd like us to take a pause at this point and I'd like for everyone to bring out a sheet of paper or whatever it might be. We're in the digital age, so you may have your tablet and your phone in front of you and you want to quickly um, think through a challenge that you're looking to address within the reproductive health space. So all of you have solutions already. And so let's go back to the basis and say, here's the challenge I was actually looking to address in the first place. Um, so we're just gonna take one, two minutes and document what those challenges might be. Right, I wanna assume that we've been able to identify what the critical challenge is and what are the assumptions that you're making? For example, in the, in the case that I mentioned, I'm assuming that there are religious constraints that are preventing young ladies from being able to access information. I can assume also that socioeconomic constraints are significantly high in Northern Nigeria and as such, you know, access to information, access to funds to access data, it is maybe limited. Right, I could assume that education level is low. Have something, identify what the challenges are and have them documented. I mentioned that it begins with you. What aspect of the challenge do you already know? That's a key question to ask yourself. What are the assumptions I'm making? Uh, what are the aspects of the design challenge where you need to learn more? Yeah, what, what areas do I need to know more about? What do I already really know? Next, you want to start to think about who are the people I would need to learn from. So I'd also like for us to write down three people or three kinds of people that we think we need information from to be able to design and create our solution. I'll give you a good example. For Northern Nigeria, my use case, a good example could be a secondary school girl or students in secondary schools. It could be mothers, right? It could even be fathers, it could be religious leaders, it could be nurses in the hospitals, it could be primary healthcare centers and doctors, people who would give me a clear perspective. And then when it comes to experts, yes, you want to talk to doctors, you want to talk to gynecologists, you want to understand what challenges do um, young girls usually present in health facilities and how difficult is it to interact with them. In context immersion, you want to identify a location, for example, and you want to go there and do an observatory study. You want to go in there and say, mm, how many young girls actually come in, you know, when they're given, you know, how eager are they to come in, what do they usually discuss? You really just want to immerse yourself in an environment that allows you to really understand what the user goes through. Now, once you're done with that, the next thing you want to do is really analyze and synthesize the information that you've got into, you've put together. And this is what you call the understand phase. So you can see here that you have several researches done, but all of that are coming together to form an insight. And insights are actually very important for defining opportunity areas. So take, for example, from your observatory study, you notice that young girls between the age of eight, say to between the age of 15 to say 18, never use the centers that you've observed. And then you then decided to probe further and went on to interview young girls in school and identified that their mothers are strongly against it and their mothers are strong influencers, right? Of their behaviors. A key insight that you, have, you can draw from here is that one, Young girls are not going to use those facilities. And two, mothers are great influencers. Then you can take that through the HCD lens and start to ask yourself, what opportunities are there 
therefore to address this problem. So by synthesizing your, your information, drawing insights, you're able to actually identify the challenge and make your problem statement, which helps you to design your how might we questions. So we go into all of that. There are various tools that you can use. There's the affinity diagram, process modeling, journey maps. We can't really take all of those on this call. Principles and goals, and then there's persona. I'd like to take um, persona on this call, and then um, we can look at whatever, what other method we can discuss quickly. For persona, you're basically um, looking at who this potential end user is, and you're trying to create, um, you know, should I say a profile of what this person is, who they are, what's their age group, what could be their motivation, right? And so for this presentation, we actually have put together some uh, a list of persona that would be relevant within the productive healthcare space um, for designing some tech solutions that could work. If I have a day for me on the call, please feel free to drop the link to the persona document. Um, particularly for this presentation, we'll be prioritizing the Jane persona. Um, Adifemi, can you please put that in the chat for us? Um, while he's doing that, your persona, there could be different kinds of persona. It could be a student. In this case, for example, you see a buyer user persona. You have a user persona and buyer persona. <clears throat> And for whatever the solution might be that's been presented here, you have a top manager, right? He's been described as rational. His goal is being documented. What does he really want? What motivates him? What are his frustrations, right? And that's basically what you're looking for, some of the key things you're looking for in your user persona. Um, if I definitely have that on the chat, I'd like us to look at, yeah, I saw stigma, fantastic. I'd like us to look at the Jane Pastor persona. All right, let me just, uh, I don't have him on the call. Let me just pull that persona document out so that we can look at it. Can you see my screen, please? Can you see a word document? Yes, I can see one. Fantastic. So we have Jane. We have Jane's age, right? Um, her occupation, her location, right? And so we're able to say, for the Jane persona, what, what is her goal? And Jane could basically be a mid-level professional who utilizes, who we're looking at one of our target audience, right? What's her goal? She really wants to improve her reproductive health issues. She wants to accurately track her menstrual cycle, find reliable information about contraception, and plan for her future family and her fertility. She uses app regularly, frequently, frequently searches for health related information, seek advice, etc. However, her problem is that she's overwhelmed by conflicting information online, frustrated with unreliable and complicated health tracking apps, concerned about privacy and data security, and experiences anxiety about reproductive health management. What does she need? An accurate health information and reliable reproductive health information, user-friendly menstrual cycle and symptoms tracking, personalized health advice, etc. And so I'm just gonna take this and put this on our chat. And then you can see all other personas there, right? But for the purpose of this presentation today, we'll try to walk through, we'll try to, try to walk through the James persona. All right, back to the presentation. Now, what does this um, description of a persona? So basically you would have interviewed a number of persons and you would have you would already have an idea of you know who the end users are. Sorry, let me put this back on slideshow. You already have an idea of who the end users are. With a persona document drawn, you are better able to see what the pain points are, what the issues are. And so you are very much likely to be able to draw insights and then to be able to ask yourself, how might we achieve this for Jane? Um, I would like to get a thumbs up if you see how we might be able to draw insights 
or you already begin to see how you can solve Jane's problem simply by developing or looking at her persona. Another way to do this is an empathy map. So basically you're saying to, you're, you're interacting with your um, user based on the data you've collected, you come back to synthesize that data and draw insight. So you're saying, how does this, so we have various target users. So we can say government workers, for example, they are the users. And we say based on the questions that we ask or the information we've drawn from all our research, what do you think they feel about reproductive health? Or what do you think they feel about reproductive health among children between three, I mean, between 15 to 18 years, young ladies within that age? What do they usually do about it, right? What do they see? How do they think? What concerns do they have, you know? And they may feel frustrated. They may actually be, what do they do? They may be doing training programs, but it's not working. They are frustrated. They see that young girls don't come in. Once you map out all your research questions into something like this, you're better able to see the problems and easily start to pick out what the solutions might be. And so this is a quick exercise that I think we can take. Can we take Jane's case and fill out what we what we think? What is Jane saying her problem is? What does she do in the moment? What's she doing in the moment to try to solve her problem? How does she feel about it? Right? What's she thinking? What does she really want? So you can do that individually. It would have been great to do a group work on this, but yeah. And um just to ensure that we are all understanding what we're talking about today, it'd be great if you can you can just say say and write what you think Jane is saying on the chat. Um so that it stays engaging and other persons can also learn from what you're thinking. So we can say think. I think Jane is thinking this. Here's how I think Jane feels. Jane says she feels frustrated, she feels, you know, and what does she feel frustrated about? Another method for synthesizing your information is really using a problem statement canvas, right? And so from all the questions, your answers you've gotten from your research, you're saying, when does the problem occur between the ages of so-so and so, when people are trying to take birth control? What is really the problem? The problem is that we're losing out on opportunities of reaching young girls within so-so and so age, you know, what is the alternative? How can we fix the problem? Who has this problem most often? Young girls between you. What's the emotional impact? How do they feel about it? What's the quantifiable impact? And what are the alternate shortcomings? What are the disadvantages of the alternatives that we have in place, right? And this can help you see, okay, for this problem, here's how we might, this, this alternative might work. This might not work, right? These are the people we can focus on. And as you start to draw that information, it starts to give you a sense of what the result might be. We do not have time to do this exercise right now, um, but insight statements are valuable learnings. They provide that aha moment, okay, sorry, right? Guys. And provides you with help on the way forward towards solving your problems. They are also very useful for framing your how might you questions. How might you questions are very, very central to the HCD approach. Moving forward, once you've been able to, you know, categorize your persona or you've been able to use any of the methods available to really start to think through what the problem is, it's very important that you're able to come to a point and say, the real problem that we are, we are going to be able to solve, therefore, for this persona is so, so, and so. It should be smart as much as possible. So here's a fair question, um, problem statement that we have. Uh, long waiting times for cancer diagnosis and treatment in rural areas of our states have resulted in delay in care, ETC. The average waiting time is now up to 10 weeks, far exceeding the recommended in the, um, time frame for early diagnosis, right? There's limited health infrastructure and to achieve equitable access, reduce patient suffering and improve cancer survival rates in communities, it's important to address this issue within the next 12 months. This is a problem statement. But what you would have in this statement is that the context, it sets the context, it sets the benefit, it's clear who the beneficiaries are, it's clear what the problems are 
where these problems occur and what we need to do to, to solve the problem. Moving to the next slide. Once you are clear what your problem is and you've drawn your insights, you start to ask the how might you question. Um, and here's a, one of the ways that you can do this. You can say, what's the problem that we're trying to solve, for example, reducing maternal mortality? Your how might you question might be, how might we reduce maternal mortality in Nigeria? But you can see that that would give you a lot of answers, right? So we've learned from our interactions with our stakeholder or with you know, our users that maternal mortality is the problem. But while we're trying to do this, we want to increase Nigerian women access to health information and services, especially when they are expecting. Now, if you, if you continue to draw all of your insights together, you'll find that once you tweak your questions or you consider your insights, you may be able to come up with something like, how might we design a cost-efficient, friendly approach to information and healthcare service for expecting women in Nigeria? And the Jane example is a very good one where you can see that she wants to ensure that, you know, there's data security. How, so you're saying, how might we ensure that we can provide a platform that can give um, adequate information about mental health, adequate, reliable information about mental health to working class women, right, while ensuring data security? That might be a good how might we question for the Jane scenario. Once you're able to, once you've discovered what the problem is and you've drawn insights and you now really understand what the focus areas should be, what you need to do next is really to work together to start to co-create. In this stage, it's really about ideation and co-designing. It's about translating those opportunities. So your insights has helped you to ask how might you questions and you're now able to think about opportunities for solving that problem. So it helps you to look beyond the opportunities and start to think about actionable concepts, right? Which can be revisited, you can redo, you can re refine, you can discard ultimately till you get to um, a final solution that is contextually appropriate and suitable for the focus group that you're looking at. So in this segment, you're really brainstorming about the ideas some more, right? You're thinking about the feasibility, the viability of your solution. You are bundling those ideas and you're developing solutions through rapid prototyping. And then finally, determine what prototype would work that, you know, would work and should be tested in this case. So let's look at that, look at it um, in more detail. Um, the co-creation, the um, create fa co-create phase really focuses on ideation and co-design. And when it comes to ideation, the best way to ideate is through brainstorming. So let's take it, take a step back and then just look at how far we've come, you know, on this journey um, as it relates to HCD. First of all, we looked at what we understand, you know, what's our personal understanding. We've interacted with experts, we've gotten their perspective, we've interacted with users, we've gotten their perspective, we've checked our research articles, we've pulled together you know, all the perspectives. We've used that to then create personas. So we sort of understand who our various target groups are and what their various goals are. We've looked at their goals and we've drawn insights from that goal to identify opportunities for addressing those challenges, right? At this point, we, we've now used that to create how might we questions coming into the ideation session. Now in the ideation sections, we are now answering those how might we questions. But a lot of the time, because it's a HCD approach, you're not just sitting in your office and saying, okay, now I understand how might I solve this problem for Jane? No, what you're doing is to go back to the stakeholders, identify it's a group of stakeholders and bring them together and brainstorm with them, right? Or do re roles reversal and try to understand and put yourself in their perspective. Or storyboarding, you're basically doing their journey maps and trying to understand, okay, this is where um, the patient usually starts in my hospital, for example, and this is what usually would occur. Or a young girl at this age, this is how she gets information all the way till she's 20. Then you're able to map out that journey and you're ideating with a group of people and you're able to say, this is where we might solve the problem. 
So ideation is really the point where you generate ideas. And like I mentioned to you, you converge, you diverge and converge. You divide and convert. So you've been able to converge, you've identified your insights. Now we're diverging again. We're saying, what ideas are there to solve this problem? And so in this stage, you really are going for quantity. You're allowing people to come up with all sorts of ideas. No idea is, is not good enough. Make sure that you're working with stakeholders. Defer judgments. At this point, it's not a time to say, this will not work. This, no, no, no. Let everybody pour out what they have in mind. Encourage wild ideas, build on others' idea. Yeah, so someone says, we can do this. Yeah, 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 we can even add this to that. Be visual. Where it's possible, have a board in front of you, put stick notes, let people share their ideas, right? And stay focused on the problem. It's important that while we're trying to be, we go for quality, quantity and be wild, that the solutions or ideas we're coming up with are those that are designed to actually solve the problem. Once you're done with that, the next phase is to start to bundle the ideas. And at this stage, this is where you start to think about feasibility, right? Um, you want to think about teams. Some of the ways that people bundle their ideas is to say, okay, let's go back to this picture. You can see I have my two questions for question one. You can see, let's look at question two. You can see about six stick notes. And we can say, okay, let's vote. Which of this do you think is best for them? And people might vote. Another way you can go about it is to say, well, hi everyone, which of this is feasible within Northern Nigeria? And they'll give their feedback and say, well, this is a brilliant idea, but won't work in Northern Nigeria. And so you probably agree that anything that may not be feasible, we have to drop at this point. So this is the point where you start to get critical, right? Is it feasible? Is it cost-effective? Is this a solution that I can deliver? So be reminded that your solution is not something you think about from the beginning, but something you actually discover as you go through the HCD process. Another thing you can think about as a way of bonding ideas, because sometimes you can have so many ideas, is to think about themes. Is to say design. How what ideas are here that inform how we should design the solution? And you can batch up everything related to design and say, okay. Another problem she said she has is issue around data security. What are the ideas here about data security? And then you batch them. And by bundling those ideas up, right, you should be able to come and pull together the best ideas, right, and create a more holistic, comprehensive concept around the solution that you want to deliver. So we'll move into the prototyping phase. Now you have ideas around what exactly you want to deliver. The rule of thumb is that you go simple. We're going to be iterating. Remember that every stage of the process, we're working with the end users. So we're still going to go back to them to say, hey, this is what we're thinking. But you can start simple. And I like the picture that we have on the screen here. You can see a tax here, right? Um, in thinking about the design, they've been able to identify that the app should be simple. It should allow you to register, to log in, to place, you know, just some basic things. And so you can, even with a paper, design what the, uh, the welcome page of your solution might look like. And then you can have several papers that just show a frame of what they might look like. And then if you're still in the same room with the potential users, you can give them the opportunity to look at it and say, yes, this is what we want. You're already designing, you're already iterating. It's always important that you start with a low fidelity um, prototype. Nothing to, nothing to, um, nothing, you, you try as much as possible to limit the cost that you're expending. So you can see two prototypes here, right? Basically showing the design basically just having wireframe. And you can see the high fidelity prototype there, right? For a, um, for a platform that you can order food or drinks from, right? This has gone all out. And you, you would have expended a lot of cost to achieve this. But what you can essentially do is just do something small, a low fidelity prototype, and where it's even possible to have it as 
you know, something that is really, really affordable, that gives you the opportunity to change and change and iterate, that's essentially what's advisable. And then you gradually continue to develop until you have something um, that works. These are also some examples of um, prototypes. Then you can see they are paper-based, um, just giving you an idea of what um, needs to do. Rapid prototyping means that you can actually build quickly. It gives you enough time to test your ideas, to create visual representations of your ideas, to get quick feedback and to quickly act on them. You're still not done. You know, once you've taken feedback and you've iterated, it's also, I mean, and you've developed your prototype, you really still need to come back to validate your solution. Sometimes you need to go to the software developers who are going to work on your solution to say, hey, here's how I think this should look. Does it make sense? Is this something that can be designed? And they say, yeah, you can design it, but this may not come out just like this. This is how this will work. This is what it will cost. And you can take that information back again to the stakeholders and say, here's a, a design, there's a prototype, right, that we've created. Do you want to test it and give us feedback, identify issues, and let us know if it's good enough? For the HCD mindset, you still need to create that room where you continue to improve, continue to test, continue to get feedback. That's essentially what makes it user-focused, right? You're going back to health facilities or you're creating questionnaires on your platforms that allow you to interact with the stakeholders to ask them some more questions, to find out if their needs are being met and how you can continue to improve to ensure that their needs are being met. Um, this is ideally where we would do um, a paper prototype for the solution that you had initially put down. Um, let me see how much time do we still have? Okay, I think we have just about three minutes to go. I'll just quickly run through. Um, as you think through your human-centered design approach, it's always very important that you're thinking about solutions that are feasible within the context where you work. For example, there could be regulatory concerns that could prevent you from actually implementing a solution. And it would be a waste of time if you do not consider regulatory concerns, um, you know, ethical related concerns, issues like data security, you know, cultural issues when designing, right? It's very important that those things are taken into consideration to ensure that your solution has a high chance um, of being successfully utilized um, and can be sustained within the, amongst the people that you're looking to have utilize it. Generally, within the healthcare space, HCD is actually a very important um, approach, both in the design of technology solution and also in the design of services um, for target population. It's generally, is very effective um, for solving problems, improving patient experience, developing innovative technologies. And because people believe, see themselves as part of the process, a lot of the time, sustainability is not a concern. A lot of the time, sustainability component is embedded, but you also see increased ownership and reduced costs in actually coming up with a usable design. Um, I will conclude here by saying that, um, you know, with HCD, we've utilized HCD on a number of projects in the past, and over time, we've continued to see um, significant uptake um, and an improved design and significant utilization in the solutions that we have developed. And this is actually a very useful tool that is also applicable within the reproductive health space and can ensure that your solutions and your uh, innovations are actually addressing the actual need of the people, um, that you're not necessarily buying beautiful lighting and cozy chairs when your stakeholder only needs a really big, long, couch right um so that brings me to the end of my presentation today um thank you very much for listening um we have some annexed um, information we'll provide that as well as relevant document reference documents that you can um look at after this session um i'll take a pause now uh, in case there are any questions or comments that you might have
Okay, thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you so much for this insightful session. I mean, my notes, my notes are actually full. I was also as intentional, you know, in learning from what that you had to share with us today. And I know there are a couple of AC staff also here who are also interested in this, and they just wanted to learn from what you have for us. So, um, like she said, if you have any questions, this is the time to ask your questions. I mean, she had to rush her slides so she could take your questions. So it's important that you ask questions. So because it's in asking your personal questions that she can provide, uh, uh, let's say localized or contextualized feedback for your uh, solution and whatsoever. So please feel free to ask any question. And in case if you are just, you don't have like questions specific to your current uh, innovation, you can also ask any question generally as regards human centered design thinking. You can drop it in the chat box, you can drop it on the group. If you're probably shy, I would read it out for you. <laughs> and there has to be a question, no? Someone has to ask a question, like, no? Okay, I think. Okay, someone was asking if the presentation slide would be shared. Yes, it's really shared. Thank you. Oh, we just have some people just joining. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay, so if there are no questions, I'll probably be asking you questions then. Is that fine to me? Yeah, that's fine. Actually, that's really fantastic. Fine. Um, so I'll just call your name and then you can unmute and then just respond to the question. So my question first is for Rabiu Abdul Wahab. What's the key um, insights that you, you've drawn from the conversations we have today and how is it going to influence how you refine your solution? Wrap you, Abdul Wahab. You can unmute and respond. So, is there anyone that wants to respond to that question? One key thing that you've learned today and how it's going to inform how you might refine your solution. I think Israel can unmute his mic. I think he has something interesting to say. Yeah, yeah please go ahead. ahead. Okay, um, thank you, Tommy, and uh, thank you, Stephanie, for the session. So I was saying that uh, um, this actually is like a refresher course. Some of us have used the uh, HCD for a couple of projects in the past, but this one offers like a specific use case to what we are doing as regards the uh, earth solutions and uh, family planning. So thank you so mm -hmm. much for again. All right. Thank you, Israel. Thank you very much. Okay, over to you, Olua Tommy. Okay, so thank you very much, Stephanie, for your time. I, I'm very sure when we send the recording, there'll be more questions. Is it okay if I send them to you via mail? Just in case if you could provide the responses. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for being a part of today's webinar. We really hope that this was valuable and you'll be able to take short information. Oh, okay. And you'll be able to make use of the insight today to refine your solution. Personally, I am going to make use of this uh, session to actually uh, refine you know, our own project development, proposal writing, and all that. And even when it comes to our ideation process as an organization, this is also going to uh, go a long way. So thank you so much, Stephanie, for being so intentional 
with today's uh, training and for sharing so much of your knowledge.